Hey everyone, Giordano here from The Juice Media. Welcome back to The Juice Media Podcast, a companion to the Honest Government Ad series. This is episode 12, a companion to our Honest Government Ad, The Machine. Scientists had been warning us for decades to prepare for this crisis. Did we? Of course not. The Machine said there was no profit in preventing future crises. So instead, most of us opted for an alternative policy. Total fucking panic, dead people and bullshit. In part one of this podcast, episode 11, we focused on the Australian government's response to the COVID pandemic. But in this episode, I want to zoom out and focus on the bigger picture and talk about some of the lessons that we've learned during this historic moment we're in, just as governments are pushing to turn the machine back on. If I could have one wish about who to sit down with and chat about what's happening on the global stage, my dream guest, it would be someone like, I don't know, maybe Naomi Klein. Fortunately, Naomi Klein happens to be a huge fan of the Honest Government ads, so that's who my guest is today. For those not already familiar with her, Naomi Klein is an award-winning journalist and best-selling author of seven books published in over 30 languages, including The Shock Doctrine, This Changes Everything, and of course, the cult classic, No Logo. I thought I'd cover all the logos on my gear today. That's my Naomi Klein flex. Naomi Klein is also senior correspondent for The Intercept, a professor at Rutgers University, and co-founder of the climate justice organization, The Leap. Naomi has been featured in shit tons of major newspapers and magazines, so I assume the only reason she agreed to come on our very non-major podcast podcast is because she shares our passion for exposing government shitfuckery. After seeing her share many of our honest government ads over the last year, I thought, gee, maybe I should try my luck and invite her onto the podcast. So I did. And to my surprise, she said yes. So here we are. Welcome to the Juice Media Podcast, Naomi Klein. Um, first of all, I just wanted to ask you, how are you? Whenever I speak to anyone in the US and particularly in your part of the US around New York City, it feels like I'm talking to someone who's been in a you know, in a, in a disaster area, um, in a war zone. How are you and your loved ones? Thank you for asking. Um, yeah, it's pretty crappy here. Um, and it it's really raw where we are. It, it's, we're, we're still very much in it. We're in a COVID hotspot and, um, and uh, hundreds of people are still dying every day. Um, and uh, thankfully, our family is healthy. That wasn't always true uh, throughout this. Um, and I'm I'm Canadian. I'm, I moved to this part of the world a year and almost two years ago. Um, I came here for a job at a university that is now closed. Um, and and it's been I think a really homesick period for us because we feel we are we we have wonderful friends here in the states, but. Our whole family is in Canada, and our oldest friends are all there, and and it's it's um, it's it, it, and we're navigating this crazy U.S. for-profit healthcare system, and it really sucks. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we want to go home. I can imagine. Uh, I can imagine, but I'm, <laughs> look, I'm glad to hear you. Um, you and your loved ones are, are are healthy at least, but at least it's um, I suppose a first-hand experience of many of the things that you've been talking about. In, in especially in regards to healthcare and access to uh, you know the basic essentials you used to the Canadian system and now you get a first hand yeah. experience in in what this is like. I wanted yeah, I think it's also a first hand experience. Like I've been writing about shock and the you know the 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 reason why you know our elites use these moments of disaster and crisis to push through their wish list of horrible policies that make things even worse when the next disaster comes and. And I've been writing, you know, I've been writing about this for almost 20 years. And the truth is, I've always been writing about it at some kind of a distance. You know, I go to the shocked zone, you know, yeah. to, to Iraq after the invasion or New Orleans after Katrina. But it's, you know, as it, I, it's not my disaster. You know, yeah. I've had that luxury of being a, a, a visitor, a voyeur, right, and documenting and and sort of seeing like okay yeah so people's like sense of emergency and trauma is being exploited but what i've realized over the past couple of months is i've never really lived it the way we're living it now like i i understand the shock doctrine but i'm still subject to it like i'm still completely discombobulated and i can't think straight and i'm worn down and it's like I'm like the shock doctrine girl and I'm just like, I'm sorry, I'm just like too shocked right now to yeah. like deal with this. I can't write anything. I can barely think. So yeah, it's 
been weird. It must be a trip. It must be a trip. (laughs) Well, absolutely. And I feel like probably learning experience lessons are the some of the most valuable things that we're learning through this uh, through this period. Um, And that's actually uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you. And referring to the climate climate emergency, but I'll get to that in in a second. Uh, Before before we get to that, I I really just wanted to say you know still as part of our welcome onto the show. And I say us because although I'm interviewing you on my own, we have a broader team. You just met half of our, our family and uh, and uh, one of our actors, Ellen. Um, I was talking to Lucy last night while I was thinking about you know this interview, and she said, uh, have, "Have you met Naomi before?" And I said, "No, no, no, not really. No, I haven't. No." She said, "That's really weird. It feels like we have." And she said, "Maybe it's because we've always had her books always on our bookshelf, you know, for most of our life, and it kind of feels like you've been a." A presence, you know, um, and I think a lot of our listeners will feel the same way that you're a very familiar voice for explaining and chronicling the world that we live in. And you know, it reminded me of something when I watched your interview with uh, Greta in in the U.S. when she visited last year, and you started off by saying, "You told the audience it's the first day that that we've met each other, but I feel like you like we know each other." Mm-hmm. Can you talk a bit about that feeling? What did you mean when you said that? Yeah, and I mean, I appreciate what you say because I, you know, and I feel like I know you too because I love your videos and that's why we're doing this and 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 they they're just so so savage and so so <laughs> sharp and and I love sharing them and everybody always loves it when I do. Um, and you know, it just it it just hits they always hit just the exact right note of disdain that our elites so richly deserve. And I, I appreciate that because, you know, we're, we're often far too too polite and deferential um, to, for people who really don't deserve it at all. Um, so that feeling of familiar, yeah, yeah. Fam- familiarity is, um, is, 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 um, is mutual. And, and, and I think having, I've been writing these books now for, for, for more than 20 years and it's, and, and and I do realize now that that there is this kind of cohort where we grew up together and 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 we um, have been understanding the world together. And I write about movements, right? So like I'm not just so somebody sitting on high saying these are the truths. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a journalist. I, yeah, I I immerse myself in in movements and 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 then come back and write about them. And I always see my books as a as a kind of collective process. With Greta. Um, you know, I, I've always, I felt very connected to her um, as soon as she started speaking and, and we started DMing on Twitter and, and uh, you know, she's, she's such a scholar. She's such a, she's such a book. She reads, she reads, she's a voracious reader. Um, And, and so we had that, that, that feeling of connection when we met because she had read my stuff and I had read, I had read her and listened to her. And, you know, I have to admit, I do feel a tiny little bit of like maternal feelings as well, because, um, you know, I'm a mom and I'm a mom of a, you know, of a, of a, of a special needs, uh, a, a kid, uh, a kid who I think like Greta, um, feels things very, very deeply, doesn't have those, those, uh, some of the protections that, um, neurotypical people have. Um, so I'm familiar with some of her gifts, to be honest, um, and challenges as a, as parents. So, um, you know, I shared that with her. So, you know, and I'm in touch with her parents too. So I just adore her. She's just so wonderful. <laughs> it's uh, all I could do not to just throw my arms around her as yeah. soon as I saw her. Sure. I, I think a lot of people felt the same way when you said that, you know, in, <laughs> in, in the audience. And, um, thanks for sharing that, that with us as well. That's, um, really powerful um i you know i've I, one of your books this changes everything you really talk about how it's necessary to uh, you don't you know i don't know if you use these exactly words because the, emer- the word emergency kind of emerged into our lexicon really last year um thanks to greta and the movement that that she helped kickstart but you were saying in that book you know several years prior that we need to basically do that we need to declare a state of emergency we need to talk about yeah. this as a, a crisis. people's emergency from below yeah that's, that's right. what i wrote about in the intro to this changes everything and um yeah that's right so you know it must have been like when greta came along i could imagine from your perspective it's like here is the <laughs> here it is you know this is it's happening mm-hmm. 
our podcasts are a companion to the, to the videos. So I started doing the podcast as a way of really kind of like being able to pick apart some of the videos. Yeah. Videos are short, as you said, they're short, sweet, biking, they don't take any prisoners. But um, the podcast kind of gives us a chance to talk a little bit more about the, the topics. And I wanted to ask you um, a little bit about our latest video, which you retweeted. I thought you'd be the perfect guest to talk about this because the, the metaphor of the machine touches on many of the issues that you've documented and exposed throughout your um, your writing life, from uh, the short-sighted shitfuckery of corporations to governments and uh, fossil fuel companies. So I was hoping to get perhaps your thoughts on the video. Um, sorry, it's a very vague question, so feel yeah, free to no, answer it however question. you want. <laughs> it's a great question, and I meant to rewatch it right before, um, before our conversation. Um, the, the, the machine wants to be turned back on, right? Um, and the machine is starting to be turned back on. So it's, you know, it's interesting timing that, that where, where um, if we don't want to go, not back, but actually to a more dangerous place, right? We have to, like we humans, um, you know, organized people are gonna have to, you know, throw some, so, some wrenches in the works. Like we have to stop this. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that, that I think was a very resonant, resonant image. And I think there's a lot of ambivalent feel about whether we want it, the machine to start again, like as it was, or this particular machine, like, of course we want jobs and we want people to have food and, and we understand that this has caused tremendous hardship and, you know, let's not romanticize you know, the bird song and, you know, like, like that is a very privileged experience of this pandemic. Like the people who've been able to appreciate, you know, the return of the wild. Um, first of all, a lot of people have been working their asses off yeah. throughout this pandemic, delivering, you know, Amazon, you know, un entirely unnecessary products to our homes, you know, and, um, and caring for the, for the, for the, for the vulnerable in, in on so many fronts. Um, so we do need some, like something needs to start again, right? Like, I, you know, as I, it's like th this holding pattern or whatever it was, or partial holding pattern is not what we want, but neither I think do we want most of us to return to that, you know, mindless planet torching roar that we were at before, right? Um, so, yeah. No, absolutely. I'm, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because the, there's been a real, there's been a, um, a different experience uh, based on socioeconomic class of the, yeah. of this. And what, honestly, that was one of the hard things about writing this episode is that it's very hard to generalize and sort of make any sweeping statements because there have been vastly yeah. different experiences of going through this pandemic. Some have been, as you said, the romantic sort of bird song. We can see the Himalayas. On the other hand, the essential workers have had to carry the weight uh, and really keep things going. I want to focus a little bit on but that is that is something like I mean yeah. I think if we th how, how do we what what do we want to be after this right yeah. I mean that's the core question right if we don't want that machine to just restart only only in, you know with even more exhaust coming right. out of it um, then then we have to have a vision for for what that looks like and I think that there are some really really important lessons and what has been unveiled by this right and 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 you know i i'm in the united states which is a society that claims not to be a class-based system and yet and yet right you have these wildly different experiences of this pandemic both in terms of who is dying right because who has the underlying health conditions that are connected to pollution are connected to stress um, are connected to food deserts and not having access to healthy food. It is overwhelmingly black and brown people who are dying. Um, in some cases, like 70% of the people dying, you know, in, in Chicago at one point were, were African Americans. Um, but it's also because these are people who, for whom the idea of like sheltering in place means, you know, um, either people who don't have the luxury to shelter because they are their work has been deemed essential or the shelter is no kind of isolation because it is so crowded right um and one of the things we've really seen very clearly is that like wherever people are being warehoused right wherever where and not just people animals as well like wherever you have this kind of 
treating of life as a machine, right? Um, in Amazon warehouses, in these massively underfunded homes for the elderly, in meat packing plants, these are the COVID hotspots. Like the virus is like a heat seeking missile, the fines where we are discarding life, right? And that is where it spreads. Prisons, obviously, right? Um, so what do we want to learn from that? Like, what is the lesson of this, right? And, I, and we just can't be warehousing people, you know? Um, and, and, and so, so if, ha, ha, whatever we build has to be built on that knowledge. You know, like many, I've been trying to see what lessons we can draw from this experience. And for me, um, I keep saying that, you know, if there's a silver lining to, um, to this pandemic experience is that the world has just received a crash course in the concept of flattening the curve, which until now, you know, this idea that by taking early action rather than delaying, we can minimize the cost, damage and, and death count in a crisis is also the central argument behind the, the need for an urgent climate action movement. It's the same principle. You know, we act now, we can manage it. We delay, it's mm -hmm. going to be it's going to be much worse. Until now, that was a theoretical concept. Now, most people get it in a really practical way. Um, so we have a conceptual tool that before we didn't have. You know, in your most recent book, On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal, uh, which came out last year, and I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I was wondering whether the COVID pandemic has given you any new insights into how humanity can rise to the challenge of flattening this much bigger curve of the climate mm -hmm. emergency. Um, yeah. yeah. Right. And so, I mean, the book is about um, the need for a very different kind of economy. And, and a Green New Deal is not a narrow carbon-based climate policy, like a carbon tax or a or cap and trade. Although a carbon tax is certainly one of the tools that we need. Um, but, you know, in Australia, people have generally sort of associated climate action with these narrow carbon policies, right? Um, a Green New Deal is an industrial policy. A Green New Deal is like, what do we want our economy to be? How do we get to 100% renewables in a decade, um, you know, for electricity and, and, and transportation? I mean, how do we do that? Um, while creating millions of good jobs? How do we protect the union hard won wages and benefits of high carbon workers in this next economy? How do we value the work of care uh, that is been has been so crucial during this pandemic? And, this, and um, I'll be honest with you, you know, people like the idea of battling, you know, economic injustice and climate change at the same time. But the biggest, the, the most pushback that I got it was it's very different than when I was out there with this changes everything uh, that which came out in 2014. W when this changes everything came out, you know the subtitle was capitalism versus the climate. I had a lot of debates. Oh, capitalism can fix this. This is how blah blah blah. Nobody's making that argument anymore. Everyone knows it's bullshit. Okay. The only thing people said, you know, and here I'm talking about the centrist journalist questions that that one gets, but but also some audience questions. The only question was, isn't it too late, right? Um, aren't we too fucked? And, and this is crucial, because what my response is, we can do this. Look at the new, original New Deal. Okay, the Green New Deal is sort of inspired by the way the US completely um, remade its economy uh, during the Great Depression to create, directly create millions of jobs, to electrify rural America, to plant two billion trees, to put artists to work in the millions, staging plays and painting murals. You know. And there were huge problems with the original New Deal. There was discrimination, systemic discrimination against African Americans, against women. Um, but it certainly puts the lie to the claim that we can't do big things fast because the US changed dramatically and much of its current infrastructure was laid in the nine years of the, of the New Deal. So when I would talk about this, or I would talk about the way the US economy transformed itself during the Second World War, which is true of Australia as well, right? People would say, okay, but those were crises. Those were moments of crisis. Um, and right now, and here we're thinking about way, way back to last November, um, 
you know, the economy is booming, unemployment is low, um, all the things Trump brags of what used to brag about. And what people said is nobody is going to um, nobody's going to will willingly embrace that kind of change when all traditional economic indicators say that things are going well, right? And to be honest with you, um, I didn't have a great response to that. You know, my response is, look, climate is an emergency. We have to act like it, right? Um, but that only goes so far because the forces of inertia, when you know, or, or or just the power of the machine when it is running at full force, is 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 very difficult to 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 counter. We are in a very different moment now, and and in no way do I want to say that this is easy. But I I, I will say that the Green New Deal, you know, one of the things I say in On Fire about what is good about a Green New Deal. Um, a framework is that it, I said it's it's recession proof, right? Because one of the things that we've learned in in the climate movement is that things generally we tend to make progress when things are relatively good economically. But as soon as there's an economic downturn, um, people say, "Oh, sorry, we can't afford all that green stuff anymore," right? Um, but the the Green New Deal is a jobs program. It is an economic stimulus program. So it actually becomes more relevant when you need an economic stimulus than when things are actually going well and you're being told that there's no need to spend that kind of money. So we are in a moment where our governments are going to be spending a lot of money. And this is the moment to be talking about what that public money, remember it's your money, right? Um, what it should be spent on. Should it be spent you know, subsidizing coal companies and airlines um, or should it be spent um, redesigning our cities so they're never again dominated by car traffic in the way you know, that they were before the pandemic? Um, you know, should it, should, do we want it to be spent on rail? Do we want it to be spent on reimagining public housing? Um, and so you know, none of this is going to happen on its own, but I think that we actually have um, more of a chance because we are not, because the machine is not at full throttle, right? I mean, if you think about flights, you know, talking about what, what is a rational use of air travel? You know, what, 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 you know, given that there is no green alternative to it, what is a rational use of air travel? How should we decide whether or not a flight happens? Having that conversation when the skies are filled with planes is a lot harder than having that conversation when there are almost no planes in the sky, which is where we're at right now. So, but that window is closing really, really fast, as you know. Um, so this is the moment to have those conversations and to be organizing towards it. When I, I keep going, when do we have this conversation? It kind of feels like everyone's waiting for sort of like a, you know, an announcement, but uh, we have to have that conversation. I mean, this is exactly why we made this video and why you do what you do, I suppose, is to really say, hey, it's now, <laughs> it's, you know. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about um, the, the the US situation. Um, you've just spoken about a Green New Deal. I know you were very disappointed uh, about Joe Biden's uh, presumptive nomination as presidential candidate. My question is, how are you feeling about it now? And I just want to premise that with just one little bit um, of news that I only learned a couple of days ago, that uh, Biden has recruited some really interesting uh, progressive, some legitimately genuine progressives um, to his platform. Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who sponsored the Green New Deal bill. Uh, Pramila uh, Japaya, who sponsored the Medicare for All bill. Sarah Nelson, president of the Association of Flight Attendants to chair three of his six joint task forces that are meant to unify the Democratic Party on policy in the presidential campaign. Mehdi Hassan, your, co your colleague at The Intercept, wrote a really good story about this, which I'll include in the show notes for anyone who wants to read it. There's many other excellent people also on those task forces, including Stephanie Kelton, who many will know as one of the key figures spearheading the uh, modern monetary theory movement. Um, they're not Wall Street and banking executives. They're not sellouts. Mm -hmm. um, does this give you hope? In, in the in the Biden nomination and uh, in a, particularly with um, reference to the to some of the things you've been talking about in terms of climate action, um, how do you feel about it now? Um, so so the, the what's going on with these committees is this is the product of a negotiation between the Sanders campaign and the Biden campaign. Um, 
when Bernie suspended his campaign, um, this was what he negotiated with, with Biden, was that he would be able to appoint, or they would agree to, uh, to certain people uh, on these drafting committees. Um, and, and it's wonderful, the people who, uh, that you mentioned and, and others like Varshni Prakash, who's the executive director of the Sunrise Movement, which is, I know there's the Sunrise in Australia, the Sunrise Movement is a youth um, like uh, a youth climate army, <laughs> they sometimes call themselves, and they've been, um, they were the ones who occupied the offices of Nancy Pelosi, uh, the Speaker of the House, the Democratic Speaker of the House, demanding a Green New Deal now, um, you know, a, a year and a half ago. So there's real troublemakers in there, you know, and, and nobody's going to push Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez around, mm. um, and, um, and they're going to get absolutely more than they bargained for, um, ha having some of those folks in there. Um, the real question is whether this, the, whether the extent to which this, what they come up with has teeth. Um, you know, there are debates about that, you know, in some ways it's a good way to kind of uh, defang the opposition, you know, create a committee, put people on it. Um, but like I said, these are not these are not good these these are not uh, good little team players. They're these not are just going to shut up and play along, yeah. They will upend the table. Yeah. They, they will, you know, they, they will. They, I, I promise you that 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 if they feel they're getting played, they will upend the table, and and we love that about them. Um, but I guess to be perfectly honest with you, I. I haven't made my peace. <laughs> I'm still I'm still grieving. Um, yeah. I'm so angry to be really honest with you. I'm really, really, really angry um, sure. that um, that the that that uh, about the way it went down. Like it's it's possible that it's possible Biden would would have won anyway. But there was a particular way that things happened where 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 you know I was you know I was part of the Bernie campaign. I was a surrogate. Um, and I went to five states, you know, campaign firm. It's the first time I've ever been involved in a presidential campaign. I mean, obviously as a volunteer, I'm a writer, but um, this is what the climate climate crisis has driven me to, you know, I'm like, <laughs> you know, and it's a part of the reason why we moved to the states. Uh, you know, I've, I've always cherished being in Canada and not here, to be honest, even though a lot of my work is here, just having that little bit of distance from yeah. From this, from the, from from ground zero of the machine, yeah. I, I like that distance, and it's helped my my writing. I think to have that little bit of distance, mm -hmm. um, but it just seemed to me that these were really important years, and 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 as the Sanders campaign became a viable prospect, and Bernie was leading in many national polls, and he won the early states, and then the party just coalesced in this brutal way around this very weak candidate and it's very it's scary on a lot of fronts it's scary because you know the, the polling around whether or not biden can beat trump is not reassuring um and it's it's it, what worries me is like i think it's great having these people on the, the committees but ultimately you need a candidate who can speak to the outrageousness of this moment who can be angry with people who can let people hmm. find their fight and help people find their fight, you know, in this moment where people are just being sacrificed, being ordered to go into meatpacking plants, because apparently pork chops are an essential, you know, item on the American, you know, in the, in the American diet. Mar it's madness. I, yeah. So it's, it's, you know, and, 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 and that's what it worries me because I know that by I know that Bernie could have helped people find find their fight in this moment. And, and when I say I'm angry, what I'm angry about is something very specific, which is that I really think it was a, a class war that happened within the Democratic Party. Bernie's base was working class people, and it, it was the very working class people who are now holding the country together. If you look at the list of like the number one um, small donor group who, who, who donated to Bernie's campaign, it was Amazon workers. Amazon workers, yeah. Walmart workers, um, nurses, overwhelmingly, were, you know, on the campaign trail with Bernie. And it really bothers me that the sort of professional NGO class, you know, the sort of professional activist and liberal class just looked at the polls and saw that Bernie was the only progressive candidate who was building that working class base. And they thought they knew better. They thought they knew better. 
and, and, and you know, they, they, and, and so I, I think that this is such a key moment where, where those of us who have this luxury of being able to shelter in place and who are, you know, um, who, whose, you know, biggest complaint under lockdown is that our kids are bugging us and like, we, and, and that like our sourdough didn't work out well, you know, like we really have a moral yeah. responsibility to stand with the Amazon workers who are fighting to have their workplace cleaned after their coworker just died, you know, you know, or, or, or people, you know, families of people working in slaughterhouses who are saying, please don't eat meat for a month, uh, please, you know, stand with us because the higher the unemployment rate gets, the less their power is, right? Like they have power when they're being called essential workers, but when unemployment is like threatening to be 30%, Jeff Bezos knows there'll be more people who will feed that machine. And they're literally, you know, they're being sent, they're being treated like cannon fodder for capitalism right now. And so I just think that those of us who are having our lives delivered to us, you know, whether it's by streaming or Zoom or by delivery package, we have such a moral responsibility to stand with those workers right now who are taking such risks. And I'm just not over the fact that 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 when it that that we could have had a presidential candidate who they chose, who the nurses chose, who the Amazon workers chose, who the Walmart workers chose. All these people are being celebrated as essential workers. So I guess I'm just giving myself a little bit of space to be to still be mad because it's really hard for those of us who were part of the Bernie campaign. It the, the timeline of all this was very hard. Like there was a call that went out where people said, you know, find share a, a picture of the last normal thing that you did before the pandemic, before lockdown. And I looked at my phone and every picture I had was a Bernie rally. That's That was the last mm -hmm. thing I did before lockdown, you know? Mm -hmm. And we just went straight from this like kind of almost unbelievable euphoric sense of possibility. I mean, Bernie Bernie won Nevada, Bernie, Bernie won Las Vegas. Like picture that, picture Las Vegas, like the most capitalist place you can imagine, <laughs> you know, li literal casino yeah. capitalism. Trump Tower on your right, you know, like gold sky rises, sky, you know, high rises yeah. as far as the eye can see. And the people who made make that city run, the people who shine the slot machines, you know, who, who, who clean, you know, the toilets in the Trump Towers came out and said, fuck you. You know, we're voting for Bernie. <laughs> it was unbelievable. He swept the Las Vegas Strip. And like it's so it's 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 hard for those of us who are part of that and really felt what a working class movement it was and it was not the bernie bros on twitter it was not all yeah. the things that people claimed it was it was such a feminist movement it was so many women who were at the front front of it um it's really hard to go from that to this sort of non-entity that is biden's leadership and obviously we know we have to be trump you know that's why we supported mm -hmm. bernie because you know, we, we you, you can't you can't beat Trump without somebody who can build yeah. the energy. Yeah. Um, we may be able to get rid of him anyway. And, and, and you know, I certainly I'm not one of these people who says it doesn't matter one or the other. I don't believe that. I think a second term of Trump is disastrous, not just for the U.S., but for the entire world. I don't think it's a continuation of his first term. I think the way these authoritarian guys interpret a second mandate, look yeah. at Modi. Look at yeah, what he yeah. did, yeah. you know. Anyway, I'm talking too much. No, no, no. I no, I absolutely it's agree therapy. with you. I'm and treating uh... it as therapy. <laughs>
um, that really is gripping uh, American political culture or just, let's say, just American society. Have you, have you kind of wrapped your head around that? that, that, that it's almost like a split in reality. It's, I'm, I'm kind of toying with the idea of making an honest government ad where the, the government just says, hello, I'm from the Australian government. You may have noticed that we live in two separate universes, you know, um, yeah. and then to kind of go from there from a satirical angle. But the reality is that actually it, that's the case. You know, even in the middle of the pandemic, there are people who think Trump's doing a wonderful job. Um, and uh, on the other side, people have the exact opposite. Uh, is this what culture war is? Is this like a schism in the time continuum? What is this? Look, reality is is incompatible with the worldview of free market, you know, ideology. Um, and so they've been at war with reality for a long time now. And, and, and climate, the war on climate science is a preview of the war on all science, right? It's all, in, it's, it's all just too inconvenient. So you just have to build your own world. And I think the fact that, that the US is led by a reality star is not a coincidence. I mean, this is Trump's skill. He builds his own reality. He's very good at it. He had very high ratings as he likes to yeah. tell us, Reminded right? Um, and so we, have, you know, those of us who've been paying attention to the climate wars have got a big preview of what we're seeing now with the like, um, sorry, I just refuse to believe that there is a virus and I'm just gonna go get my nails done. It's my God given right, you know? Um, and and yes, it's extreme in the U.S., but we're seeing rallies like it in Germany, and you know, there this is a global phenomenon, and it's certainly present in Australia. Yeah. I think that there's also like we, you know, I think we underanalyze the role of so evangelical Protestantism in some of this, and and the way in which the sort of rapture is being reenacted in you know this. Mm. corporeal realm um, with a sort of idea that the chosen have will be fine will be rescued um, and and um, in some ways they're right because money it does buy a certain degree of protection right you can buy your bunker you can um, you know you can you can people are buying their own ventilators mm. in, in in the US um, so there's that but my I have to stress again, I guess if I'm honest with you, I have written off. I'm going to get misquoted. Well, not. <laughs> I, I was. I'm just going to get quoted. <laughs> no, That's I, enough. Yeah. My battle is not with Trump supporters, you know. And here I mean like the sort of hardcore of the Trump supporters, because I think there are lots of people who are just like, ah, oh, let's just see what happens. I hate the other guy. Let's just mix it up a little bit. Just thought it was a laugh, you know. People voted in kind of an unserious way for Trump. But then there's just like hardcore Trump supporters. I, I'm not going to win a battle, you know, an intellectual battle with those folks, you know. And, and that's why I think my battle is is with like the people who, 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 who saw Bernie surging in the polls and thought, let's gamble on, uh, on Biden, you know, who we know is, is a, a more riskier candidate. Um, and what is it about, I mean, I, I'm having trouble with words because I know liberal means something different in us. It's in, fine. In, no, no, no. People can code switch. Don't worry. But I think this sort of, this kind of, um, the kind of the meritocratic liberal class, right. It, 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 and 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 the the depths of the hatred of of the left of, of of a kind of a working class movement of a sort of the scruffiness of it um i think i think that's the biggest that's the biggest problem that we're up against because we didn't have to end up with biden um there could have been a real alternative yeah. that was addressing frontally the crises of our time and i, I Bernie's not perfect. I have lots of quarrels with Bernie, you know, um, but you know, he was, as you say, he was talking about Medicare for all. He was talking about living wages. You know, he was talking about the climate crisis. He was, he had a multi-trillion dollar green new deal as part of his platform. And people were just like, you know, like, it's just too much. It's just too much. And let's just like kind of romanticize Obama. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so in this moment where the people who supported Bernie are just 
being sacrificed so literally in order to keep our way of life and to get the machine running again. This question, you know, I was doing, a, I did a webinar with a progressive group in the States and I was on with um, a guy named Eric Ward who works with the Southern Poverty Law Center. And he said, the only question that matters is whether liberals are gonna stand with labor or stand with capital. And that's really stayed with me. And I feel like that, that's the question. Like, I, I love your honest government ads. Keep, keep taking on more, like to keep taking, take, keep taking on your crazy, goddamn coal addled government but i actually think that that that, the, that we also have to take on the small l liberals yeah. you know um who are so afraid of the the change that that we need to actually keep us safe so afraid that they will saddle us with these uh, they prefer johnson to corbin and i worry that they preferred trump to sanders and and we need we we need to challenge those folks um because because I think the cost of that has never been more stark. And maybe we can maybe we can win some of those folks over. I think it's more likely that we will than that will change the minds of the sort of hardcore climate change deniers. What do you have to say um, about our Australian situation? Like, what do you say to Australians who, you know, might be following your work? And also, you know, as a Canadian citizen, um, you know, we have, there's a lot of parallels between as settler societies and mining colonies between Canada and, and Australia. We share a very similar thing. One of the things we don't share is treaties with uh, indigenous peoples. Very recently, there's been some good news coming out of um, Canada that, um, um, British, the Wet'suwet'en people have, have entered into a historic agreement with uh, with the government in BC uh, over the coastal gas link pipeline. And I was wondering if you could just very briefly mention, you know, what is your take on that as well? I haven't reviewed it enough. I actually probably shouldn't comment on it because I haven't been um, I haven't been following it as sure. closely as I should have. Um, I think that. And it's interesting you mentioned treaties. I mean, British Columbia is not is not is mostly um, unceded. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's entirely unceded. Um, I mean, not to say that treaties are are are, are documents that 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 cede territory. They don't. They are agreements to share territory, um, and we break those treaties very liberally, including our dashing liberal prime minister Justin Trudeau, um, and and. Um, you know, Trudeau is a reminder, really, of, of, of how dangerous liberals are. You know, yeah. I have a friend who says the liberals are going to get us all killed. <laughs> She's been saying it for years and I always say it back to her. She's <laughs> never written it publicly, so I can't say who it is, but I always think she should write that up. The liberals will get us all killed. We always call each other up. We just text each other. The liberals will get us all killed <laughs> um, because it is less clear, right? Because yeah. people get killed by it. Um, Especially when you know, they're so dashing and fashionable and, you know, it's like sure. this kind of like charisma that's oozing out of them, yeah. And they look so good compared mm -hmm. to the yeah. Scott Morrisons and the Trumps and the Bolsonaros. And, and, and um, you know, the truth is that Trudeau has, has, has done some, some good things um, in, the, in the context of the pandemic. Um, uh, um, but, you know, th th you're talking about somebody who bought a pipeline in, in order to ram it through indigenous lands in British Columbia. Um, it's a different pipeline, not the Coastal Gas Lake pipeline, um, but, the kin uh, um, uh, but the Kinder Morgan uh, uh, Trans Mountain pipeline. There's so many pipelines to keep track of. Yeah. Um, but, you know what, um, but we've got a lot of work to do in Canada. Um, and I think it's just a reminder that it isn't just about changing the government. It really is about building the kinds of broad based movements that um, have a sense of true collective authorship mm. over the demands of what, what we want. Right. And that absolutely in Australia and in, in any settler society, um, indigenous leadership, it needs to be co-led. Right. It isn't just I think, you know, one of the one of the things that we have learned in many ways the hard way building coalitions in Canada. The indigenous groups are not like one member of a coalition, you know, with different interests. It is, um, it's, a, it's a different status. It's a nation to nation relationship, right? Um, so, I mean, one, one thing I would just plug as, as we say goodbye is there's, there's an initiative that 
we've kicked off with a group that I co-founded called The Leap um, with War on Want in the UK for a global Green New Deal. Um, and um, you know, it comes out of a critique that a lot of the ways in which we were talking about a Green New Deal in North America and in the UK and in parts of Europe were, um, you know, really were leaving out the global south. Um, we were originally going to be having an in-person convening that got canceled and now has sort of moved to a digital space. We kicked it off actually today with uh, an event with Aradati Roy and we had 4,000 people joining us live and there's awesome. been tons of interest. So I think that there needs to be, um, you know, that I, every time I've been in Australia in recent years, I've met with different wonderful groups um, who have been trying to get something like this off the ground in Australia, and it's never really happened. Um, sort of just been baby steps, not the kind of leap that we need. But I think if there's ever going to be a moment like on the backs of the wildfires and 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 yep. this pandemic, um, you know, we need to think about what an what is what is an essential economy? What builds on the lessons? of what we learned about what was truly essential in these moments of crisis and how we need to value the work of care and build, um, build relationships and communities that can weather the shocks that are gonna keep coming, you know? Um, as we come out of, of isolation, like, let's not just go shopping, you know, like, let's actually have some real in-person conversations. Um, let's let's make good use of each other's company um, and 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 build power. Naomi, I'm going to ask you one last question and then I'm going to let you go at slightly personal big picture question to end on. I always like to sort of remember that ultimately there is a bigger picture here. We're on this insane, crazy journey that as humanity we're on. Maybe mm. it, humanity is something we're aspiring to rather than something that we already are. You know, big philosophical questions about, you know, are we going to make it? Do you see us, you know, sort of actually getting through this? But in the middle of all this, I just wanted to end on a, on a question that perhaps relates to your personal motivation you know, why do you do what you do? You speak so passionately, you've, you've dedicated your life to all of this. You could just sort of have a comfortable job at a university, just, you know, get some grants, supervise some students, retire early, sort of maybe buy a bunker. <laughs> you know, why do you, why are you fighting? Um, you know, what, what, what motivates you? Just something to leave our listeners with. You know, it's a cauldron of, a cauldron of 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 forces that keep me going of emotion um not to be too witchy about it but you know there's like as you you heard a little of the rage that keeps me going yes, yes. <laughs> you know i have a vindictive streak there's a fire um, there yep um and but i but it's also you know there is there is also fear you know i'm uh, i'm i am i i fear for the world that we have created, you know, unless we change course, I fear for for my my set my son um, and his friends and all of us, you know. I don't, I don't think it's just the kids we have to worry about, you know. By the time things get even worse, you know, you and I, um, we're, we'll be in walkers, and um, at least the kids will be able to run, you know. Um, so, I. I, 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 I want I want better for us. I want better for us. Um, and, and I think that that comes from a place of love, right? I mean, I am a bit of a hippie and I do deeply, deeply love the natural world. And I find it unbearable to think of the depletion, of the depletion of, of, of wonder and beauty and just the the unnecessary hazards that we are creating for people who deserve none of this and for non-people who deserve none of this. Um, and so it's that kind of mix of fear, rage, and lots of love um, that keeps me going. Um, and I don't think we have an option uh, to give up. I think that is the ultimate luxury pro pro product in this age of massive and disgraceful inequality. This idea that we can just kick back and just watch it burn. 
Um, you know, I, 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 I just have nothing but disdain <laughs> for the people who imagine that as an option, because even imagining it as an option is, is just comes from such a place of, su of such privilege. The vast majority of people on this planet are just thrown into the fires um, through no choice of, their, of theirs, uh, mostly through choices of ours. Um, so this is a moment where we need to really decide who, um, you know, whose side we're on. Um, and we really need to fight because um, it is a fight. And that's one of the things I learned in the Sanders campaign, right? I mean, my God, they came at us. We were, it was a hydra headed beast. You know, it was just like, we'd slay one of them. And then it was like, oh my God, now it's Pete Buttigieg. Oh no, we, we, now it's Michael Bloomberg coming at us. Oh no, it's, uh, it's Biden again. I thought we'd slayed him. No, he's back. You Heads know? Back, it was just yeah. like, end, it was just endless. Um, but the thing that I, really felt so much you know is that there's so damn many of us and people want to come together you know that was a beautiful thing about being part of that campaign and these rallies of like 20,000 people and and watching you know the people who had been discarded rise up and say you know we want something better we got fucking close we got really close and i think once you feel that once you really feel like, oh, actually they lied to us. They told us we were marginal, but we are, we're not. You know, we're many and people long to fight for people they don't know and to be part of something bigger than themselves. So once you've glimpsed that, and you know, goddamn Bernie, he gave us all a glimpse of it. Like we're not gonna let go of it. I, I'm, I want to end on that note because that's, uh, those are really beautiful words and I think they really resonate strongly. I think, you know, the fear rage and love um, is really part of the what keeps us going and you know we just like to throw laughter in there because that's another thing that really laughter takes away fear can be both good and motivating but it can also sort of paralyze and I think laughter helps to generate the right kind of fear which is the one that motivates action rather than the one that's sort of you, know, you go oh I'm alone I can't deal with this kind of thing so yeah. um, thank you uh, Naomi so much for um, taking time to talk to us. I know you're very busy. I also want to wish you happy birthday. I believe you just uh, had, a, had a big birthday in your life. Thank you for all the work you do from all of us. Uh, please come back one day on, on our podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure. Keep up the amazing work. I look forward to whatever comes next. Well, that brings us to the end of episode 12 of the Juice Media Podcast. I just wanted to make one comment before we conclude. A couple of people have asked why I don't have guests who hold significantly different views to me. I know some podcasts specialize in that, but to be honest, I envision this being more of a chance for me to talk with and help amplify the voices of people I find interesting. That being said, I don't see why we can't also host the occasional debate. I'm still learning the ropes in the world of podcasts, but once I get more familiar with this medium, I hope to do that too. So I hope that answers that question. As always, we want to thank the people who make this podcast and the Honest Government Ads possible, our patrons, and all those who support us by other means. If you want to help us keep going, you can do so at thejuicemedia.com forward slash support, or simply by sharing this podcast and recommending it to your friends and family. You've been listening to the Juice Media Podcast with me, Giordano. We'll catch you soon for our next Honest Government Ad. Till then, take care. So this is Alan, hey. one of our wonderful actors. Hello, lovely to meet you. And this is so Lucy. So great to meet you. Wow. Who does all the voices. And this is our little boys, oh, Juno and Luca. No. Nice. <laughs> well, you're all so incredibly talented. And I'm a huge fan. So thank you so much for all you're doing. Thank, thank you, Naomi. Thank you for all you're doing. You're quite <laughs> yeah. a big fan of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.